Kia ora everybody, what's up? It is Rebet and welcome along. Another, we've got some educational futurist heavy hitters joining the mix. Francis Valentin, how are you my friend? I am so great. Uh, founder and CEO of the Mind Lab, Tech Futures Lab, the f- future of where the world's going. Clearly the world's escalated many of the plans and strategies which it probably should have been thinking about in this last week. How's, you, how's your world been flipped upside down? <laughs> Yeah, we we, uh, we saw what was coming probably a few weeks ago, and we f- fortunately decided that actually it was a good time for us to embed everything into into virtual. So uh, all, all of our formal programs, masters programs, postgrad, everything moved. Day one of lockdown, we just started delivering our first four online programs, uh, and everything else has been pretty good. We've moved everyone home, and it's uh, it's been a bit of an adjustment, but I think we're well into it now. Plenty of businesses and people that work with them don't even know what Microsoft Teams are. You, you uh, <laughs> front, front help, front foot of business. Maybe um, give people a quick bit of context around Tech Futures Lab and and um, the space you kind of play, especially around the education, I guess, the future space, because I think many people are struggling with a lot of these questions and technologies and things which they probably haven't to do before. Yes, yeah, so I think it'd be a good, quick bit of context. Cool. Um, so Tech Futures, it really focuses between two areas. We've got our formal programs. So we have masters in... Uh, in technological futures, we have programs on human potential, thinking around the digital economy. We're doing new programs right now around connected environments and thinking about how do we, you know, how do we look at the world through this connectivity of, of devices and software. And then we also have our corporate side, which is it's increasingly um, impactful in terms of large organisations trying to navigate where the hell they're going to go uh, in this new the, sort of the new economy. Now, of course, even pre-COVID people were having some pretty big dilemmas around legacy versus trying to, to move forward, move people forward, cultural change. Uh, the conversations I've had in the last 10, you know, 10 days, two weeks, uh, the accelerator's on. So actually mm. all the things I couldn't do a month ago suddenly are all possible and, and have to be, you know, have to be implemented. Do you think that Corona has been used as a perfect vehicle for many brave leaders who haven't had the backing before of either you know the boards or whatever to really push go on all of those things they wanted to be brave about to take their entire organization into the future yeah look i think it's it is the permission that they've all been looking for Mm. i think it's uh, for a lot of them they're looking at historically trying to take the whole journey everybody along the journey at the same time and now they're realizing People who are really mobilised and willing to change, are, you know, their their best step forward. So they're putting a accelerator behind the people who are on that journey, and then they're hoping that people will come behind them and understand that the world is different in in you know, next month, next year, different again. Well, I think at the moment it's every day seems to change and tweak and and whatever. Um, I was I was just going to say for for many of those, obviously, um, I didn't realise how many. <laughs> directorships and board things you're on you're 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 you got heaps on Jeez. okay so <laughs> direct, direct director of water care director of dual deal with board of trustees founder and ceo of tech futures lab mine lab founder and ceo board member at callahan a selection advisor for the ehf fellows director harper lily t- director um on on being bold <laughs> man you are just geez okay so maybe let's start there have there been more more or less beating board meetings in the last two weeks <laughs> Uh, I think you added together all the one hour meetings is probably more. Uh, oh. the same, yeah, the, the meetings are very different right now. And I, I think actually the biggest job that people in governance roles has is to get out of the way of, of senior management teams to get going because actually nobody go wants there. to write reports right now. Yeah, go, go there for a second because obviously in big organizations where it comes to risk and responsibility, see the shareholders or different bits and pieces that comes with it, systems and processes which they need to go through. How have the rules changed from, a, I guess, a government's and sort of board perspective of how, how leaders in New Zealand that actually move the dial are thinking about how, how to enable their, empower their teams to actually operate and try and thrive forward? I think the biggest difference is, is really people saying to teams on the ground saying, you know, don't let us slow you down. This is not the time for us to be documenting everything. This is the time for us to keep us informed, but the natural curiosity of directors is to want to ask a million questions and get answers before anything happens. You know, everyone's trying to sort of take their foot off the accelerator on that one and say that to the teams, the exec team saying, look, you're best positioned to know what needs to happen here. Just just keep us briefed. If you've got big questions to ask, ask them, but otherwise permission to go. The, uh, the boards themselves, are you seeing the energy of it thinking about like how are they? Th- how are boards? It doesn't need to be specific to anyone in the businesses, but are boards thinking of this in two phases? Of like, okay, 
this is happening now, so we're very reactionary to the moment to make sure things can either operate, keep us on the share market, whatever else. And then is it simultaneously, okay, and then what? Dot, dot, dot. Or is it, like, where, where's the energy of, um, I guess, key decision makers? Because it's really, I guess, most of the employees and the small business owners and, and, the, and the teachers and the students, it's very much like, I'm not doing this this thing, but then there's this this other layer of next level thinking with the the then what? Where's the the energy and sort of strategic pieces kind of going at the moment? I, I guess in, in all of my board roles, I am the and then what person, you know. So mm. I'm there to, to bring that clarity and visibility. Now, obviously, right now, everyone's got to understand that nothing is going to be the same going forward. And I think that one of the key things for me is. If you think about all the critical things we've tried to address before, and, and if I use the example of climate change, we haven't had enough impact. Uh, if we think about the pressure that's been on the system, hasn't been great enough to get buy-in from everyone. What we're seeing now is because this has changed the rules, coming out the other side, society's going to be different, not just business. It's not going to be just about how we consume things or how we think about new models of, of the economy or business structures. Actually, even the way we think about how we live is going to be changed. So, so what we need to do now is pose really big questions. And so we have to think about what will those questions be we need to ask it, it in leadership teams and board roles to actually make sure we, we don't lose focus of what the future is, but also noting we have absolutely no idea because there mm. isn't, we don't know how big or how long it's going to go for, but we also don't know what society will, how it will respond. So if I think about consumption, you know, everybody right now at home cooking dinners for the first time in a long time, you know, at the end of this, they're yep. suddenly going to go reimagine food and, and this, this idea of community and, and sharing will change or the way we think about, you know, can we grow our own food? Can we think about how we change our diets? Um, how we think about buying fashion or cars mm. or material things, and, you know, all those things are going to be up when I think people have been caught out without savings. People have been caught out with the expectation their jobs were safe and, and businesses that overnight have folded. Yeah. It almost feels like there's going to be two different, multiple worlds we could be living in. The one which is we are mentally thinking it's going to be, you know, say four to six weeks. I can almost guarantee if you stay locked up in a spot and get in a routine for two to three months, your mindset will shift into a different way of existence for the future opposed to, not that it's a blip or a short-term thing, but I know if you're, your headspace will be different if you think it's a short-term break to go back how it is, or if you pass that transition mental point to be like, actually, to, I think that that's a really interesting word you said, the, the reimagine piece, um, because then you'll be sure, actually, maybe, do I need that much shit? Maybe not. Shit, maybe I'll go more minimalist. Oh, do I need, maybe, do I need that office? Maybe I don't. Do I, do we need, you know, I think that, that I'm real. So what I'm really intrigued to see is I think the, the, the future of the world will dramatically change every single day that is longer than one month. Because yeah. more people will start switching of old world, new world, not take a break and jump back into it. And I think that in some ways that could be, it could be good, I think. Yeah, I think it's going to amplify. So the crisis will amplify behaviors that we haven't thought about before. And we have to figure out what what aspects of our lives will be amplified. And so mm. but for people who are getting into a, a stricter fitness regime right now, you know, well, you know, after a month, if you're doing that religiously every day, of course it's going to continue on. It's that sort of a seven day rule. You know, start to do things for seven days, you do it for a month or two months. The routine. Um, yeah. those, the, the opposite, you know, the people who sort of lose motivation. You know, I think that we have to be really careful that um, while people are in lockdown, that we don't actually incentivize people to be idle because actually if you're idle for too long, that does other things around in terms of mental health, but also in terms of your value. So we, I think as an employer, you have to be thinking about how do you keep your, your teams active? And that could be active mm. learning. It could be giving them projects, research. It could be whatever it is, but having people sitting at home doing nothing could potentially create other issues that we haven't even imagined yet. Do you feel that um, it's going to reset absolutely every part of everything? Where it's going to like, I, I don't think in human history an entire global economy has stopped ever. Stop, stop, like pause and then reboot. Like, what are the implications after these things? Like, what will the future of work be? The future of education? The future of housing? The future of shopping? The future of the future of dot dot dot. Um, yeah, but it's going to be monumental. What do you think the biggest industry that's going to have, it's not come to Jesus moment for the future of, of the future, but where do you think, what do you think the biggest sector is that, that is really 
um, going to embrace this the most as an opportunity? I think we're going to appreciate craftsmanship a lot more. I think people going back Ooh. to craft. Yeah, I'm really of the view that the you know people will start to realise with more time and the ability to be still for moments and to embrace mm. stillness will actually get people thinking about other things they're really passionate about. It could be writing, it could be you know creating cooking, it could be languages, whatever it might be. I think that we will start to value the individual skill sets within a collective a lot more, mm. particularly as we start moving away from just buying stuff that we potentially will start to realise we don't need. And if you look after the, the First Depression, that whole generation were, were savers. They, they went into life thinking well, we don't, you know, I always, it's interesting if you talk to people who have got grand, grand, you know, grandparents who are reasonably old, they'll talk about they live a frugal life, not by choice, but because actually they've always had, they've always cooked food, preserved food, had a garden, you know, made use of the, the clothing they had and things, you know, it was just how they grew up because they grew up under that depression. And so I think that that will actually have massive impact on the way we think. And, and then we'll start to value some of those more human characteristics that we've actually kind of pushed aside for and, and almost said to everyone, be part of the collective. You have to live fast, live beyond your means, showcase things that perhaps really is not who you are. And I think we'll get much more comfortable taking away the, the layers of who we are at work and showing more of the, the layers we are underneath the facade and actually yeah. bringing one, oneself forward. Yeah, there's different ways that they've been talking about that for corporates, I guess, you know, bring your, your whole self, be your authentic self to work, blah, 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 blah. You, you wonder that authentic self, if it's been going publicly for the last year, then after this, how how much more it will actually change when, you know, the CEO is there and a cat comes jumps on the shoulder or a kid's come running past or a thing and just being able to be in their living room with them. How, how much do you think, Francis, that like leadership will now change with the types of dynamics they're having to deal with, with all these different... There's a lot of dynamics going on. How do you think leadership will change after this post-corona? I think a type of leader will be really different. I mean, there is a theatre of a workplace. So if you think of the average, particularly in a corporation, you know, if you if you want to work towards the top, you act and behave in a certain way and you respond to certain requests. And and so the theatre, by moving home, it's much more egalitarian and, and actually we're, we're normalising things and, you know, the cats and the kids and the things going on behind you is is now part of everyday life. And mm. and I think that when we look towards leadership in the future, we will be saying, you know, what is their real ability to make a difference in this organization for the betterment of the organization, but also for the customers they serve. And there is still there is still a lot of um, same, same in within leadership. You know, there's lots of teams with similar backgrounds, similar age, similar educational backgrounds, and very little diversity of thought. And I think this is where you're not going to be able to navigate the problems we're going to have to face in the next year if we have people who think the same way. So you know, we'll, be, we'll be trying to bring those other people forward who perhaps haven't fit the typical profile of a leader and suddenly they'll be the ones who have the solutions that we need. So you actually see not only a new type of leader emerge, actually potential massive shakeups of, of board, the way boards look. Well, a board, I think, particularly with executive teams, I think we're... The doers are going to need to be doing things so fast and to be so agile. And if anybody has, has come through the ranks and doesn't feel really comfortable without the sort of structures and, you know, say the theatre of business, and then actually they're going to fall away and people coming through will be the ones who are sort of the hustlers and the ones who want to get things yeah. done. And they actually, yeah. I think that, that mentality is going to become really strong. Yeah, okay. It just sounds like my stock went up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I mean, I've had to deal in the last week things that I've been trying to get across the line for you know years, you know, potentially months, in some cases years, have happened within thirty six hours. And I'm just it's like, a, oh. what could this not have happened before? And it's and it's really is uh, everybody's starting to realise. I mean, some of the things are around just bureaucratic processes around banks or around government agencies. You know, you think about the the wage subsidies and the contract subsidies that have been paid up by government right now with mm. high, high trust, minimum words, you know, process within, you know, 24, 48 hours. You know, if you talked about that a year ago, if you talked to an, in a governance role, if I had said to in any board or any executive team, Hey, look, in a year's time, what would be the potential? The whole world would have closed down. We'll have 3 billion people in lockdown. 
um, you know, we'll have a, a pandemic coming around, we'll be facing a depression. People would have looked at me like I was a, comp a madman. I mean, absolute. The, the what if, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so outside what, what the what if could ever have been. You know, we just don't think that big. And so now we realize that the what ifs are not just around the things we've already been planning for, you know, climate change and and some of the cultural issues around generational divides. And, and we've got, you know, big challenges at the moment and inside all our all our countries around mm. access and, and and fairness and things. But actually these are just such much, much bigger questions we're going to have to be solving. Um yeah, Vic was talking about it. I interviewed her last week and, and she was saying, you know, she's been surprised just how it's funny how fast it can move when the people actually want it to. Yeah. You know, and, and it's like and then for you, I'm sure you're sitting there like, guys, Guys, we talked about this. I gave you the slideshow. We talked through this like two years ago. <laughs> like, is it valid? Is it a is it a weird, weirdly, as for as much chaos as it is going on, is there's this weird sense of validation that it's like finally people can see it? Like, finally, okay, yes. Like, now we can have an actual conversation instead of the copy paste brick wall. I love that word theater. I absolutely love that. I think that's, yeah, it's, yeah, get it. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we have seen some really amazing behavior just in a week. I'll give you an example. We have a, a program, we've been re-educating New Zealand teachers now for five years around digital and collaborative learning. And so over 5,000 teachers have gone through this formal program. And we have an intake starting in a week's time. And we were thinking, gosh, you know, we normally would plan for 70 people to start that program. We were like, what will happen? You know, teachers are on lockdown, schools are closed. You know, we can assume that that may not go ahead. Well, in the first week we were in lockdown, it went quiet, people were pulling off. It was, you know, we're thinking, okay, this is, this is not looking really good. And then we, we, we kept in communication with them. We were having daily hangouts and check-ins with them and various things. And now we actually have a cohort starting next week, which is bigger than we imagined pre-COVID-19. You know, so these are teachers around the country saying, this is the perfect time for us to understand what digital means. This is the time where we've got time to be learning again and actually- it's the reset. Yeah, and the and the burning platform is already it's already been been burnt. I mean, they're having to live digital every day right now, and they're like, okay, we've been talking about it for a long time. Now we absolutely have to do it. Feels like some validation there. It's like, yep, talking about it, great. What do yeah. you think happens in the education space? How 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 big does this this shift go? Because I'm imagining, obviously, there's been a lot that have gone to digital environments now you you were just saying you know your, your teenagers are doing all these zoom calls and bits and pieces how 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 big of a shift do you think happens in education after this look it's been happening for a long time and we've seen higher and higher um rates of non-completion and, and particularly in traditional university programs and schools are really grappling with even i, I was recently some new zealand data showed that the lowest participation in intermediate schools you know so at 11 years, 12 years old, you know, kids just not turning up because of relevance. And, you know, we've got challenges around a, a sort of a generational divide about what kids expect and what they're getting. Hmm. And it's a blanket statement, but if you if you take my own household, um, two, two children at high school, very different high schools, two at university, different programs, um, there is the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, there is, you know, the, the ability in one case to do everything online, you know, fully delivered, online classes facilitated on Zoom. Others, another one is literally a worksheet and almost nothing that they can do. Uh, and then uh, the university students, you know, one is is handing in and submitting everything um, they can. And and I have a, um, and then one in architecture who has now moved everything digital and actually able to submit everything they would have physically made sitting around the kitchen table now being able to do online. There's, so there are, people have shifted really quickly. You know, we, we were very fortunate across all our programs. We were already delivering a huge amount of it online, but always facilitated, not not like a scheduled self-paced video, but actually a facilitated in this type of environment, but, you know, with hundreds of people potentially at the same time and little breakout rooms. I think where people have embraced it, particularly over the last few years and are ready to go, they'll do really well. Mm. Where institutes and schools haven't kept abreast of that and right now are really feeling the pressure that they haven't got a a really viable education experience to offer their students, there is going to be a, a lot of kind of backpedaling and figuring out where they where they didn't put the investment and what do they do about you know, fast forwarding investment and also talent capability development so that they can continue on. Um, 
you know, it's and in, and in our case, you know, we've just uh, submitted three new programs to NZQA in the last week. Now these have been in development for months and months, but just happened to be they were due to be. Together. And the, the first of them was in organisational agility. Now couldn't come at a more important time. Uh, a second one was is leading change for good. Again, you know, mm. we looked at lots of leadership programs, but they were all about people looking for leading to make money. You know, what were the shares? What were the dividends for the for the shareholders, and how yeah. would they make profit? So we wanted one that was leading change for good, and the third one is in um, connected environments, the idea that to get great data, you need to have connections, whether it be through you know, 5G connections or IoT or wearables. Now, all of those three programs talk about a future state, you know, the world we're going into, and now we've been hustled through to this new world really fast, you know, sort of super speed. So programs that haven't moved, and if you go back to a lot of education programs, they're still sitting in what it really looks like something that could have been taught 20, 30 years ago with no variance. Mm -hmm. So I think the other part's going to happen is content and programs, the multidisciplinary aspect of what people want to learn is not going to be these little tight silos of I want to go into a school of business and learn about traditional economics or, or business yeah. practices. It's going to be people saying, hey, hang on, none of that makes sense anymore. Actually doing that right now would make zero sense coming out of COVID-19, actually, mm. we do need to be thinking about what we're learning and how that's going to prepare us for what comes next. That, th that three combo thing almost looks like that's the perfect, you know, Corona commercial pack, three for one combo, <laughs> which they flip and need, right? You should just brand it like the Cor Corona triple pack. <laughs> it, yeah, lead, lead for good. Because I think that's what's happening. I, I, I've been thinking about this, that idea you had about the, um, you know, like leaders, a new type of leader. And you know, talking with Jason from from Vodafone and and Vic and a few few people, it's just like I think this this new leader, you know, leading with love and being kind and actually having more empathy and that old school style of stuff you. This is how it's done. This is what we're doing. Is going to not only expose them, but it, it's actually going to alienate the people, who, the, the most important asset. And can can it's almost gonna, I think it's going to really expose every single business. Those with bad culture are going to crumble and whittle and everyone's going to jump. Those with shit leadership's going to get probably, you know, exposed and become too transparent because they don't know how to, you know, either empower their team or the micromanaging shit or whatever. And then there's going to be these like pockets of packs that become these virtual like tribes that get so like in with each other in the same boat, in the same page and the speed that they will go out. It's it gets me pretty hopeful that actually it's going to um, in, in many ways wipe out a bunch of the ones that were going to was going to be inevitably done anyway and actually empower those that are doing good stuff so i think you're probably right the good and the bad it's going to and the ugly it's an interesting way to probably yeah, think about it yeah uh, and look i think that, uh, that leading you know for good is every you know if you think about the number of people who work in roles which the economic benefit is not what they're there for. You know, anyone in health, particularly right now, in education, any, people who are working in social enterprise, not for profits, um, you know, people who work in government roles. There's probably, if you looked across a, a country like New Zealand, where we have got a, probably a disproportionate number of people who work in roles, where what they're trying to do is move the dial in a positive way forward. But actually, we spend a lot of our time talking about just organisations who are trying to make profit, you know, and I think those organizations will be having some very hard conversation if the only purpose they have is profit right now mm. because obviously you know, there isn't going to be profit for, for very or very few people will have true profit for the, for the foreseeable future and those who are in the foreseeable you know in very lucky fortunate position right now to be doing booming because of the sector they're in will also have to be very mindful of people more than ever before because yeah. people are going to expect that actually it's not, it's, it's people first and then profit. I think it's going to be the new norm. And I, I totally agree. And I, I, what's yeah interesting about it is during this time, if um, when it's clear that it's becoming about, you know, the people and the families and the just the, the empathy they'll have for others, when they go back to, to work and all of a sudden then the gear shift, it's like, all right, cool, now let's make some money. I think a lot of people are going to have this little come to Jesus moment saying, well, is that actually what I'm here for? I don't think I'm actually meant for this role to do that. I actually quite enjoyed having time with, you know, maybe, you know, my kids and, and got a bit more, you know, love in my life, you know, maybe, you know, just, I think, I think it's going to, I think HR is about to explode and law is about to explode. <laughs> like HR coming out of this thing, man, it's going to get aggressive because there's going to be so many, all the bad businesses are going to get 
mushed and all the all the good crew are going to want to bail and all these good things will be growing and all the ugly ones is going to be just so much oh yeah, yeah. hr cheese it's, it's interesting I, I have friends of mine who are psychologists and we we talk about the benefit of middle age and no matter you know whatever age you want to put that on now we you know we keep closer and closer you get older you get you sort of push middle age further out but middle age the purpose i think is we get comfortable in our own skin and we start to understand the real value of who we are you know we get yeah. comfortable of, of, of not being kind of so caught up on the appearance and and saying the right thing and having the right friends and you know the right house we know we, we get kind of it's sort of like a great mechanism um and i think this is actually this time is like a midlife midlife crisis for capitalism oh, it's sort I of like it. yes it's going to be like you know this sort of kick in the ass that is going to be we're going to suddenly look and go what does that actually mean and let's just start to reformat mm. what it is we want the world to look like going forward so probably segue is perfect to the next one you said before about big questions that they'll be asking what do you think the big questions that businesses and i think maybe two questions what do you think the big questions is employees will be asking and what do you think big questions the the employers will be asking or should be asking so employees i think have for a long time now been asking for a bit of transparency about what organizations are doing and why they do it you know i think we've moved so far beyond the idea of mission statements and that nobody remembers to actually purposes you know, people want to work for organizations with purpose but they also want to believe that that truly is the driver and it's not just lip service and then i think within the organizations the expectation that people can contribute in there with the talents and skills and capability they have and that it's not a hierarchical decision making who gets to have a voice at the table and so they'll be how how do we we look across an organization to make sure we're not leaving great ideas on the shelf because that person doesn't have that right voice to come forward and and actually that's already been happening over the last few years when people have left you know high paying jobs for lesser paying jobs where they actually feel valued and i think that idea of value is really important and so i think one of the key things will be value um i'm really a very strong belief what's coming through already in this crisis and certainly when i'm on online calls with global groups um people are talking a lot more about the sense of place mm. actually feeling that actually we're going to question how we work when we work where we work from and this ability to have calmness in our lives and not just be on this conveyor belt of just going faster and faster and faster and so if you have a month or two at home and suddenly you're like, wow, I really love hanging out with my family. And 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 I, I wrote a post yesterday about intimacy in terms of with people. It's, it's actually about having long conversations with a few people, not about having lots of short conversations with many. Mm. And actually I think almost everybody values intimacy of long conversation. You know, it's sort of like long copy versus short copy. But yeah, we've been yeah. fast, living so fast that we live in sound bites for so lo so much. So, getting books off the shelf and reading a book from cover to cover within a day or two, instead of a pile of books next to your bed where you've read the first chapter of many and you haven't got any further because you haven't got the continuity. And so, I think those things will come through and, and work as well. They'll be saying, "I want to work on things which are longer term and meaningful, and mm. they're not just sound bites of we'll do it today and it's got no impact for tomorrow." It's just you know, it's almost so that that will change. I think viewpoints of business. Yeah, it feels like it's um, depth over width. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way of looking at. It. And then companies will be and organisations will be forced to to reflect back and say, well, how do we allow or or accommodate those changes? If we've been working one way, if we've been very kind of uh, sort of hierarchical or structural or process driven. And we're all about the system says no then how do we turn it around to make sure we can attract the very best people and retain the best people who are starting to say actually my life cannot just be my work yeah and the and the two hours of traffic and maybe some the whole suite um colleen says i work for apo and it's about music and the last week we created online programs for people at home it's been amazing keeping the music alive we're about music and people who attend live symphonies say it's better than meditation we're doing more at the apo than the biggest orchestra globally we're engaged with our business partners donors and audience and all done from home our listeners in a week have been close to six hundred thousand. jingle that bells so fantastic like i just love Damn. that and i'm, and I'm here seeing these music festivals coming online now around the world where people are 
you know, literally doing these, you know, global gigs and streaming yep. live. And I think the APO to do that so quickly is just hats off to them because, you know, I think that is, again, that's that ability to provide calmness and stillness in people's lives when things are all very stressful to stop, sit, yep. and listen to music, I think is a big part of one of the great benefits right now. The, um, the art will make a, a, a comeback at the mainstream. I think create, I, I obviously, you know, in the, in the media scape and I, I love the creative side, I knew straight away, as soon as it popped down, I was like, okay, you watch all these musicians get locked in. And when musicians and creators get stuck in a room, they get, they go crazy and they just create. And so I think there's going to be this massive wave of art, music, comedy, creators, videographers, journalists just creators you know like artists um of all shapes and sizes and and looks and and now it's it is a global platform you know like there's um just so much i'm, I'm really excited for the the, the waves of yeah it's, it's a similar thing there was, a, it was the baby boom after the war and everyone came back and th that happened well now i'm like creators are going to create and, and i'm quite i'm really excited for all the new um ideas and things that get brought into fruition into the real world after this thing as well i've been been watching a few like you know musicians and comedians and things would just get trapped up and it's this this forced isolation is is just driving new types of creativity which i think is going to be amazing to see i get really excited about that yeah look i i think even myself i'm finding myself writing drawing doodling you know chatting all those things that you know you need time for a lot more and i think we'll, we will definitely get the outputs from creatives but we'll also get the outputs from inventors and from scientists and people who have actually now have the, the, the pressure is there to do something different, but also the time is there to change things. So if you look over history, when we do the most amount of invention and the most, you know, the big things that change, it comes after a crisis because the crisis is the, is the trigger for people to do something differently. And, you know, I, I'll be thrilled if I don't get another someone calling me up saying, hey, I've got this great idea for an app, you know, and, and <laughs> yeah. I like, it like Google, you know. And actually, you know, that, that sort of that very short term, like, you know, let's immediately, I'm going to just create and, and just for the purpose of selling, I think we're going to start people sort of sit back and go, okay, I've got time now to really think about things I want to solve. And how would I like to do that? Or how I'd like to create a new type of music, or I'd love to write that story that's been sitting in my head forever. So yeah. I'm, I'm with you, I think there's going to be some amazing outputs um, over the next few months and years. Mm. I, I feel there's, there will be less future regret for more of the world where usually you know like you can you'll see someone that maybe have worked in a corporate for 20 30 years and they've absolutely kind of hated it they've just done their thing and and they feel like they've lost you know half their life to this thing this 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 machine or this the way it was or everyone's just in the rat race you know type type shit and then they'll suddenly be like man i i really like you know cooking i really <laughs> love painting i really love why don't I do that? And I think there's going to be a lot of career shifts because it's forcing people to exactly what you said before, Francis, was like to stop, to pause, to be still. What am I about? What do I represent? Does this actually make I me think, happy? You know? Yeah. And I think the other thing is a lot of people, of course, have had reductions in salaries or in some cases they have, you know, unfortunately lost their jobs. And I think where people will start to realize they can survive on less money, particularly for those who had a reduction because they're not going out there spending it. You know, if you think of, if you, if you were like in my staff, a lot of my staff across the board have taken a 20% reduction. Um, you know, we're all in it together. We, we, we don't know how long we're in this for, but they were very open to that. And so they've got more time. But at the same time, what the feedback is saying, gosh, you know, without going out and, and out for dinner and buying lunches and coffees and, and transport and everything else and parking. And actually, you know, we, we can see that we don't need necessarily as much money to actually have a great life. Now, obviously, we, we, we're all looking forward to getting out of confinement, but I think that if you if you start to realise when people go, actually, you know, a month or two in, in lockdown and they come out saying, I haven't really bought anything for that period of time apart from perhaps food, they might go, well, actually, what does that mean in terms of my job? How much do I do every day in my work role because I think I have to have a certain level of income versus actually I don't need that level of income to have a happy mm. life? In fact, I may have a happier life if I don't have to be in that rat race of chasing the next dollar. There's a lot of um, tough looks in the mirror for many, many, many people all over the world right now. You can, I can see, I can feel, I see the messages, I see, see the thinking. What gets you most, what's your biggest fear for all this, for New Zealand and then the world? 
There's, there's a number of things that are so uncertain right now. And I think that New Zealand, from a lockdown point of view, and I think we've been very fortunate that we've had a leader who has made some decisive deci you know, decisions very quickly, which I think is going to vastly improve our odds coming out of this in terms of the death rate. I sent a video this morning from a friend um, and it showed basically corpses being piled up in New York and body bags and put into truck refrigerated trucks. And you know, I sat there and stopped and and it's still sitting with me. It's still giving me anxiety now that having viewed it. And I'm, you know, on one hand, I'm like, I, this is the reality. This is what's happening across in New York City right now and in many places in the world that actually, that, that I think that we, my fear is right now that we don't take it seriously enough, that we actually, people start getting a bit lapsed about staying home, start living outside their bubble and start actually living as though, well, we're not going to be part of the worst impact. So therefore we, you know, we can kind of lessen things up. But actually the whole world's connected. You know, whatever's happening in the US today or in Spain or Italy or wherever else things pop up in, in the catastrophic effect Effects is going to affect families and connections and our economies and our trading nations and and so you know I think we get complacent over time but we can't be complacent this is unprecedented I, as much as I really dislike that word it's it is and we are having to behave in a way that is not natural because we're social and and I think that my fear is if we if we don't take it seriously enough and if other nations don't then the impact and, and locking people down for really long periods of time will have terrible impact on things like mental health, on family violence, on poverty, on inequality, on education, on the future of you know getting things going. So you know we want to we need to do this really well once. Yes, but that's going to it's asking a lot of people to change behaviour. With you know I think of India four hours notice for lockdown. You know. They, you know, we, we were very fortunate here. We had 48 hours or at least, you know, 24 hours of, of you know, the like, mad panic, but 48 hours really before we were all physically locked down. And we've got so many things we benefit, you know, we're benefiting so many levels. We've got so much privilege here mm -hmm. that we should never forget that we're in this with the world. And um, it's a pretty tough time. What gets you most hopeful about the end of this thing? People. I, look, I have mm -hmm. a, a, immense... On the flip side of immense belief that people will do the right thing, that they will they'll be uh, come out of this. They say they'll create, they'll generate good things, they'll ask for positive change. Um, I think that the momentum and the tide of change is now um, unstoppable. Positive change will come from this, and we will look back. And I think we'll look back in the early first twenty years of this of this century and go, well, you know, what did we really achieve versus what's really important. And I think people will be part of that change. And it won't just be millennials and Gen Zers and the alpha generation who are younger coming through saying, what were, what were you all doing? It'll be people suddenly having that wake up of, you know, we, we have um, got the ability to think about things, the environment very differently. You know, we've got the ability to start thinking about inequality differently. And actually technology is an enabler, is the best tool. We are so fortunate, if you imagine if this, mm taken place 20 years ago where the majority of people i had no internet no smartphones no fiber you know no no video platforms you know the, the so the technology we have today now has really come into play that actually we can now see with great technology we can do great things because it's infinitely scalable and connecting and less and less people are on the wrong side of the ledger who don't have the technology at least in terms of a smartphone and actually we can now start to see the impact and scale that we can have really fast if we use technology smartly. But it's not about just, you know, watching endless YouTube videos or or uh, Netflix, it's actually about using it. And I'm hearing great, you know, you're probably hearing that some of the solutions around the coming out of lockdown will be around tracking technology. So we know who you've been near so that we know if there is an outbreak that they can notify people saying, hey, you've got a chance that you've actually been exposed because we know, you know, Fred, who was within, you know, 20 metres of you was unwell and other people around him have become unwell and therefore, Rebecca, you need to get checked out. Like, I think technology like that is going to be part of the solution. So we have, I guess, to a certain extent, sort of 
either adopted technology as consumers and said, these bits of technology suit me because it gives me fun and entertainment, but now we need to embrace the bits of technology that actually enable us to do really good stuff and really impactful things, which sometimes is trickier, harder to explain. It's things, you know, around data and machine learning and and the IoT and, and AI, those things, we all sort of go, oh, that's all a bit scary stuff. But once we get a head around it, we'll start to see that the things that will make the world move in a really positive direction will actually be enabled because of some of the groundwork that's been done already around mm. technology. Yeah. It's a solid, solid way to wrap it. I get, yeah, when, just hearing the, the way you break it all down with that, I think there's the, the balance is going to be just that, that tipping point of, you know, if we can get unified to do it right once, it changes the entire game opposed mm -hmm. to if people take the piss and thing, things don't because they I think everyone realizes the the pure fix of what this this thing is doing um thanks so much for your time Francis I know you're very busy with your million board meetings and all sorts of <laughs> shit you got going on so I, I appreciate that you can you can quickly jump on and have a have a good yarn to the folks so it's 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 really awesome man. I appreciate your time oh look it's been so great to share this time with you it's great to see you a bit I know I'll see you soon see you when I'm back yeah okay ciao Francis see ya ciao Francis Valentine, absolute good human. So rad. Good to talk to her again. Um, and just, it's funny, that, it's funny, you know, when you're a futurist and you, you see the future with what it's, what it's doing, where it's going, and you're trying to tell people all about it. It's like, hey, this thing's coming in. And then, you know, I'm sure many people have not, not listened. And, and now it's been forced down, um, forced into the entire ecosystem to just crush and do and embrace and, and go and just this whole new world I, i'm th i think i'm kind of call it like bc pc like before corona post corona what was what, how would business be different and, I, and the point she said about reimagining is awesome it's a, it's a word that's been brought up a few other times how are you going to reimagine your business how are you going to reimagine your life how are you going to reimagine you know how much shit you may potentially not need how much stuff you do that you potentially don't need to do you know very good chats good day team well obviously it's Friday. Everyone's tapping out. Plenty of stuff going on. Uh, big week that we had this one this week. Jingle bells. I've been going to town. I've been. I'm not gonna lie, team. Not that I'm tired, but the mental, the the mental weight of so much gnarly intellectual conversations all day continuously, plus all my other shit on top of it, which I try to smack out after it's been it's been a lot. But so worth it to have. Um, friends in the circle will help share the, the, the value and the learnings to others and just have bringing up different things which others may not have thought about, you know, all the way from the implications of what's going to happen with people that make, you know, airplanes that are now not flying around the world to um, people in different scenarios with school and, and uh, education, politics, power, media. It's all connected, team. So enjoy the rest, fams. Mega day. See you soon. Adios. Deuces.